That's what I'm talking about. I gotta say, Game Pass has been a real treasure trove for me this past year. In addition to offering the greatness of Bethesda's catalog to day one heavy hitters like Plague Tale Requiem, Game Pass has also been an incredible avenue for exposing the public to indie games. One great example is the topic of today's video, Midnight Fight Express, a third person isometric beat em up recently released in August 2022. Now, I'll admit, I'm always a little skeptical of indie games as plenty of them lean into quirk and weirdo gameplay convention over giving me something that's unequivocally fun to do but Midnight Fight Express, or MFE as I'll call it henceforth, is a pleasant surprise and a great value on Game Pass that I might not have otherwise checked out. So let's get stuck into why this isn't just your average brawler or indie game and figure out whether you should catch a ride on the Midnight Fight Express. Yeehaw heck is Midnight Fight Express. Well, I can't tell you what the name means outside of the fighting, but as I stated before, it's a third person isometric brawler, but where MFE makes its mark is its fun, silly tone, its breadth of combos and upgrades, and diversity of enemies and environments. And what makes all this variety most impressive is how much of it was done by one man by the name of Jacob Zwinell, a Polish stay-at-home dad who juggled game development with raising his new baby. So right on, man. The world needs more present fathers. Paternal butt-kissing aside, Zwinell came up with the basic concept of an action game based on classic corny 80s movies, settled on a clean visual design, designed and built the levels, hand-animated the fight animations, at first anyway, and more before finally enlisting some help on the presentation. Eric Jacobus, a stuntman indie filmmaker who's most well known for mo-capping Kratos in the 2018 game as well as Ragnarok, actually saw Zwinell's work in his demo stages and wanted to provide his services but couldn't get a hold of him. Coincidentally enough, Humble Games actually reached out later on and asked him to join the project after all, which he was elated to do. He, Zwinell, and Humble actually conference called the motion cap sessions and fine-tuned them together live. Zwinell also worked with Noise Cream to make around 45 unique up-tempo dark synth tracks to really get your blood pumping into channel that 80s fist-pumping cheese. And while admittedly most of the soundtracks in the same key and the same tempo, so it kind of runs together at times, it's generally pretty fun to listen to, even by itself without the gameplay context. The last major collaboration Zwinell made was with Adam Miller, who penned the script based off of Zwinell's story. At first, I didn't get a whole lot out of the story. It was weird having all these dialogue pop-up text boxes and having to click through them all, although it's nice that you can still move to your next destination while doing so. And while these text boxes felt archaic and intrusive at first, by about the one to two hour mark, I started paying more attention to the narrative and found that there's really an actually pretty decent story here with some fun twists that recall all the best tropes you've seen in classic action cinema over the years, but with a decidedly modern twist a la John Wick. You play as Babyface, and the story starts with you stripped down in an interrogation room being questioned by Agent Smithman and McClune, looking for answers about the rash of violence and gang wars that has overtaken the city the past couple of hours. These short interrogation sections act as part of a classic framing device for the main gameplay, which is comprised of Babyface's flashbacks to the previous hours of the night. Now, as he regales the two detectives with his story, they quickly realize that he doesn't remember much of anything before this night, and he can't quite suss out why everyone he's met so far seems either deathly afraid of him or wants to kill him. The talking drone, named uh, Drony, that acts as your sidekick informs you that you're actually a sleeper agent who's been brainwashed and that you have to stop the crime wave taking over the city of tomorrow by dawn to get your life back. It's super contrived, but it's all tongue in cheek, so that's kind of the point. So off we go. What follows is a relentlessly brutal fight to the top of the underworld through hordes of themed bad guys and various bosses. It feels quite a bit like John Wick 3 specifically. Everyone seems to know who you are and speak in hushed tones or want you dead because of your reputation as the most lethal fighter in town. 
And without spoiling too much, it appears you have connections to the city's mob boss, Kingsworthy, and taking him out is the only way to really undo the crime wave. Figuring out the true nature of that connection is just one of the fun little twists in the game that recalls some great action movies of yore. So while the story builds a sense of escalation as it gradually reveals all the connections between the disparate characters you face on this night, the actual payoff in the last boss fight is pretty underwhelming. It's one of the easiest fights in the game and very basic in its design, supplementing the boss's simplistic moveset with a small crowd of low tier enemies to distract you. For a game that's so crazy and over the top for much of it, I could help but let out a disappointed sigh at the plainness on display here. Oh, and for those of you who are curious about my specific quibbles about the ending and the aforementioned twist, here's a brief spoiler section before we jump back into the rest of the story. Okay, well the short story version is that your character Babyface was once the right hand man to Kingsworthy, who had a master plan to maintain the perfect city by building a robot army to keep the peace. His peace. It's nearly a Rachel Ghoul kind of, I do this for your own good, you know, I'll burn it to the ground to build it back up type of thing. But of course, he alone determines what's good and enforces this with an iron fist. But everything changes for you when you have a son and supposedly grew a conscience or grew soft and it's implied that you weren't having any more of this authoritarianism. Kingsworthy has your son killed to get you focused again and even brainwashes you in hopes of controlling you yet again. Your son's consciousness is implanted into a drone as one of the prototypes of Kingsworthy's robot army and your son eventually escapes to find you and set things right, which starts off the events of the night. Essentially, you're playing Darth Vader, the incredibly powerful and ever-loyal apprentice to Kingsworthy's Emperor, and you had a change of heart once you'd realize what you'd become, and just like the Star Wars films, you'll punt your old boss down into the abyss and end his reign for good. Now, it's too bad this boss fight is so simplistic, being one of the easiest in the game despite having to basically fight bad Iron Man and his goons, and just like that, the game's over and you sit on the rooftop, possibly bleeding out from your wounds, but at peace with your son. Now, what's pretty cute about this whole thing, though, is that Zwinell's clearly making a story that reflects the strong bond that he has with his own son, so that softened my disappointment up a little bit. That being said, the ending's not miserable or anything, just less climactic than I would have anticipated, based on how good the previous 8-10 to 10 hours were. Now, the primary reason those previous hours sung, though, was because of how vibrant the whole presentation was and how consistent the whole vibe had been. Noise Cream potently underscores the action with compelling sense and percussion, and there's just this constant influx of self-aware pop culture references throughout that become a fun game of spot the popular thing from the early to mid-2000s. You've got Death Eaters and Voldemort from Harry Potter, clawed guys who say bub that are aping Wolverine, which is a confusing animal metaphor to say out loud. Chef Favreau seems to be referencing the John Favreau cooking show. You fight a guy named Kyler Turden, a la Fight Club. There's an almost verbatim no Russian level. Sons of Anarchy references are my favorite, a gaming journalism publication having a shut-in nerf fight office party that you crash. So, that's the thing. There are so, so many more, and while the game can feel like it's dragging through repetition a little bit in terms of its gameplay, the attention to quirky detail really helped keep me engaged and enjoying my time with the experience. But of course, all these stylistic garnishes won't mean a whole lot just by themselves, and work so well because they effectively smooth out the repetition that you can expect from the core brawler gameplay. MFE definitely suffers from feeling a little samey over its momentous 40 level runtime, but it's not for lack of trying, and the core gameplay is really quite fun. Each of these 40 levels is based around some different type of area gimmick, whether it be an airport, train station, bike chase along the freeway, or what have you. And while there are some vehicle sections we'll talk about later, you're primarily moving from pockets of about 5 to 10 enemies at once and using martial arts moves or weapons to kick the living shit out of all of them. Now we'll learn who's the best! Yeah. Now, like most melee games, you'll mostly be alternating between light and heavy attacks and dodge rolling as needed. You'll also have access to a focus ability which slows down time and allows you to survey the area for important items like what can explode or what your enemy's health is at, but this didn't really provide much tactical advantage so I didn't use it very much. The general rhythm of combat is likely to remind people of the Batman Arkham series, but it's more technically correct. The best kind of correct. To say its lineage descends from 2012's martial arts open world game Sleeping Dogs, my favorite GTA inspired game outside of Saints Row the Third. MFA perfectly captures the same satisfaction of dismembering your foes or breaking bones and even shares some pretty similar animations like how you elbow enemies who have you in a chokehold to break free, use strong kicks to break blocks, or perform intense finisher moves on enemies near railings or the edges of arenas. All that to say, it's great to finally see a sleeping dog spiritual successor of sorts that scratches the same itch because god bless does that game's combat slap and so does MFE's.
And while much of your basic attack instincts will wind up feeling like button mashing in the end, the game also offers a robust set of alternative combat options like picking up weapons in the environment to deal extra damage, or even kicking random debris at your enemies to stun them long enough to create an opening. These weapons have distinct advantages too, like how the swords will tear through enemies quickly in disgusting ways, whereas a bat or a suitcase or a whiskey bottle may deal increased damage relative to your fist, but will take a little longer to beat someone down with. They're all fun to use because of how much they turn the tide of battle, so you'll never really be dissatisfied satisfied with whatever's lying around. Be quick about it though, because any weapons that get dropped can easily be picked up by your enemies too, and then you're right back in the same pickle. Now this goes for guns too, which aren't nearly as common as melee weapons, but show up more frequently than guns and sleeping dogs, let's say. You've got pistols and various machine guns, as well as some juicy ass shotguns and grenade launchers. They're all powerful and control like you're playing a twin stick shooter, so they reward mastery of the controls and keeping your aim trained in the proper directions that don't end up feeling just like cheesy auto win power-ups. The last projectile weapon weapon worth mentioning is the one that you have the most consistent access to, which is your 3D printed sidearm. This pistol fires one bullet at a time before needing to recharge, and requiring you to switch to a new bullet type, which can be something like paralyzing or electrocuting an enemy, or sending them into a frenzy against their allies. There's a whole skill tree dedicated to the sidearm alone, so while it's mostly optional, it's extremely important in some sections where enemies block nearly all of your melee attacks. Oh, and speaking of skill trees, here's where the real depth of combat comes from. For each level you complete, you earn a score based on combo variety, kill diversity, time it took to finish, and a no death bonus. You'll use this score essentially as a currency to buy skill upgrades and cosmetic choices like new hairstyles or outfits, many of which unlock late game or require tons of replaying levels to earn enough XP. Fortunately for people like me though, you don't have to grind unless you really want to, and the average 1-2 to two skill points you earn per level completed are enough to keep you powerful enough to progress. As for the abilities you unlock, each is part of a skill tree dedicated to different playstyles or emphases. One corresponds to the aforementioned sidearm. The fighter skill tree increases combo chains or grants you really powerful strikes to break the big box or really powerful strikes to break blocks. The finisher's skill tree lets you um, finish guys super fast, so you can finish a whole room of guys with your weapons or even just your hands faster than you thought possible. Maybe more than you ever dreamed, really. Interesting. Sorry, what was I talking about again? Oh, there's also a grapple skill tree, which evokes the grappling options sleeping dogs used, including how you can smash guys. Uh, into the environment, that is. Last but not least is the rope skill tree, which lets you pull enemies towards you for follow-up attacks, or even electrocute those whom you lasso. It's fun, but often didn't work as the tutorial said it did, though I found various other places I didn't know how to control either, so maybe I'm just a doofus. The counter tree has parry and repost moves, as well as useful options like disarming foes. This one, in tandem with the finisher tree, is probably my favorite tree, as it makes combat so much less grindy and gives you a lot more prompts to even out the odds. Whew, and holy shit, if that wasn't enough optionality in your melee fighting options, there are multiple on rails There are multiple on rails vehicle sections that task you with shooting down other people's rides or jumping action movie style between them to take out the driver. Sometimes this formula will be spiced up by yet another party shooting at you from a helicopter or a minigun wielding jeep, and you've got to dodge the reticle that appears on screen, all the while staying alive amidst the bad guys you were already dealing with. Some of these can be a real bitch as they're so frantic and disorienting, but, but some have silly exploits like chaining jumps between jet skis to knock the drivers off instead of staying on yours and trying to shoot them off, so I guess it balances out in the end somewhat. All that to say, combat and encounter design has a lot going on and a lot going for it. I'll admit, I'm not always prone to tapping into the most complex aspects of gaming combat, often trying to find the lowest maintenance approach that's still effective, you know, 99% of the time. And I did so here, as mostly button mashing got me where I needed to go in the normal difficulty. But there's definitely room to get good at this one, while taking the skill tree seriously and playing the game skillfully and intelligently, as the game can be really hard in places and ask a lot more of you than my basic bitch tendencies. But overall, I'm so glad to finally play something that channels Sleeping Dog's level of brutality and crunchiness, not to mention the quality of its animations. Combat feels generally great, and that's just a hard thing to quantify from an outsider looking in perspective, but you know it when you see it, and sorely miss it when you don't. MFE has that X factor, and it carries the whole experience. And if you're thinking the combat looks good and very, just wait till you meet the cast of bad guys you inflicted on. While admittedly there are only a couple of varieties that play super differently, they always at least look wildly different. I bet there are a good 20 to 30 different enemy types, and many of them tap into that pop cultural reference realm like I mentioned earlier, like the warriors or this army of sewer rats that explode into radioactive goo. And there are even zombies, which we'll talk about later. Bosses are an interesting design space here as they're roughly 12 or so and can range from a tough melee fight to being chased by a giant lawnmower. Or is that called a lawn aerator? 
I don't know, whatever that thing is that always shows up in horror movies. I do wish there was a little more variety as the really fun ones had the most visual flair and the most unique move sets, like the aforementioned lawn thresher thing or one on the dance floor that randomly has areas that damage you while dodging this boss dude in a pig suit with an electric guitar weapon. You know, typical stuff. And the game needed to keep up this kind of flair throughout because despite the plethora of cool little flourishes, parries, ropes, guns, whatever, the combat can definitely kind of wear out and I had to play this in short burst oftentimes. Now I don't like downing a game that does its basic thing pretty well and recaptures the glory of a series we'll probably never see again in Sleeping Dogs, but I definitely felt like the constant rhythm of button mashing through enemies till my drone started talking, indicating the fight was over, running a little ways, then having the camera pan over to a new enemy group to repeat the process was a little played out by the end. But Overall, the game repeatedly offers so much good kinetic feedback through its controller rumbles, quality animations, and even little touches like how the bad guys cry out when you take them down all contribute to making you feel like the baddest motherfucker around. But all those compliments aside, I do want to take some time to focus on what I wish was balanced or designed differently. Sometimes the game's depth perception is just off, like when you're fighting between two train tracks and sometimes the train will hit you even if you're not remotely near it. The game also has some trouble giving you a reasonable proximity to pick up weapons on the ground, so you end up having to find that perfect Goldilocks spot on the ground where the prompt will appear and you can then pick up the weapon. And because the fights are so constantly frantic and it's so easy to get cheap shotted to death trying to pick these up, you'll end up on the wrong side of a crowd surf many times which is a real feel bad moment. Now, that was my experience, but while researching the game's skill trees, I actually came across a claim that you can click the activate button while dodge rolling across these weapons to pick them up and have them ready to go by the time you reach your feet. I don't remember this ever being explained in game, but if that's accurate, you're welcome for the tip, and I hope you have a better time with some of the humdinger fights than I did. That being said though, even little tips like that don't even out the cheapness or RNG feeling of some fights where you just have to hope the enemy AI gives you a break so that you have a chance. Armies of gunmen require the luck of the Irish not to just get insta mode by, and I found many checkpoints with these types of groups extremely dependent on how aggressively I was being shot at, only making it through if the enemies just randomly chose to shoot less to give me an opening. Aside from the sloppiness of some fight designs, there are some levels just dedicated to fuckery. Chapter 23 is notorious for being one of the hardest levels. Look up YouTube walkthroughs and you'll find several comments of people who either quit the game or almost did at this level. It's easy to see why. It's a driving mission and you're trying to avoid incoming traffic while dodging an enemy vehicle with a minigun. The only problem? You're basically going down the street totally blind as to what's coming up ahead so you have to just kind of luck out and weave between lanes hoping not to get bad luck fucked and die on impact to these cars. I tried for an hour, found almost nothing online about how to cope, and promptly uninstalled it, furious that I had been having so much fun and couldn't see the end of the story. Then I had one gnarly commenter tell me to look for the lights of the incoming cars that would show up in the appropriate lane and that would tip me off as to which lane to avoid. So I reinstalled it, but as soon as I got back in game, I noticed that it had either been patched or had initiated some help for me, possibly because of how many retries I'd taken. Big red arrows started flashing in the lane of traffic the next incoming car was in, and this section went from impossible to doable, and I got through it in a couple tries. And based on the fact that other commoners also seem to think this was patched, I have to really commend the developers on addressing this very specific issue. So while I complained hard about it when it was there, at least they did fix it, so that's pretty awesome. One last level I'll point out as being specifically pernicious was the zombie level in a graveyard. You're given access to all sorts of cool guns and even a crossbow, but the zombies can auto grab you for a near insta kill from fairly far away and without any recourse if the game decides you were within range. Even playing like a kiting little bitch like I normally do in games, I had a pretty tough time staying away from them, but also keeping them on screen to be able to aim at them. I finally figured out that I had to use pretty much all the other guns in the area and save the grenade launcher for last to try and get them to group together and take out a bunch at a time. No other strategy came even close to working. The sort of arbitrary length at which they could auto grab you was really hard to plan against and beating the level relied on the slimmest of margins, but worth noting out of all my complaints I either found a workaround or it was actually patched out of existence. That speaks pretty highly of the product as it approaches its final form. <laughs> So, yeah man, that's Midnight Fight Express. It's brutal, violent, gross, ridiculous, and very funny, and never stops trying to be more fun than it was the level before. It's unfortunate that even the best brawlers tend to wear out their welcome, and MFE certainly falls prey to that eventual on way. So that leads me to recommend you to absolutely play this game, but in short bursts so as not to wear out what the game does best. 
It's also a little unfortunate that as pulpy and John Wick adjacent fun as the plot gets, that it ends up ending with a whimper, not a bang, sort of undoing the second wind of momentum the story achieved once it started getting a lot more plotty and justifying the inclusion of all the wacky characters in a cohesive and meaningful way. The story can't quite shake the feeling that it doesn't totally care about its dramatic impact after all, preferring to instead evoke an inoffensive but hardly transcendent 80s hokiness that leaves a sheepish grin on your face. This is just a really, really promising start to Zwinell's career, and I'm just so impressed that there's this level of style, panache, and fullness of features and content here. There's even some DLC planned according to Zwinell, so that's even better news. I can easily see this being worthy of sequels in the future, and I get the impression that Zwinell feels the same way, so here's to hoping. So don't mess about. Make sure to catch this train before it leaves the station.